All right, our next speaker is going to be uh, Todd Zimmerman of Zimmerman Volk. Uh, for those of you who are from Lafayette, he's done our residential downtown market study. Um, uh, that was uh, first done around 2005 and the update in 2011. Um, those market studies are similar in nature to the ones that he's done literally all over the United States. Um, it's hard to find a place where he has not actually uh, done the work, but uh, he's uh, essentially been responsible for, for forecasting what is going to be the demand for residential living in urban areas. As many of you know, um, a lot of people started talking about this mainstream maybe five or six years ago when he was dealing with it decades you know, uh, prior. And now the interesting thing is, is it's actually happened. You don't have to guess. You don't have to guess that people are wanting to move to the cities. How many people are from Baton Rouge? Baton Rouge? Okay. You've got a downtown that uh, a lot of people said was horrible and awful and will never, never, uh, uh, you know, rise again. And, and yet you've got DPZ who was there in 1999, I guess, or 2000 to do a downtown plan. And now you hear regular newspaper articles about, oh, they're building 300 more units in the downtown. There's thousands of hotel rooms. There's everything going on. In another couple of years, you won't be able to recognize it. And a lot of it has to do not only with the planning, but with the demand for living in urban areas. So that's what Todd's going to talk about. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Can you hear me in the back? When, uh, when Nathan says me, he actually means my partner, Lori Bolt who was uh, invited to be here, but she's... No? Can't hear me? What do I do? Attach this to my lip? Can you hear me now? Is your hearing aid turned up? <laughs> can you hear him now? Go ahead. How about now? Yes. Everybody can hear me. You're going you're gonna to regret that. Uh, when Nathan said me, he actually met Lori Bolt, my partner, who was invited to be here, but is uh, on the board of the Congress for the New Urbanism and is required to be in Seattle at a board meeting. So she sends her apologies, and uh, you'll understand why after I finish. This is my topic, how cities can leverage changing demographics, economics, and lifestyle preferences. We still think uh, a about ourselves as Americans in a very old-fashioned way. How many have seen this ad? It starts off with a guy looking at the girl and saying, I'm never getting married, and then he says, never moving to a suburb. And then, sadly, in his normcore outfit, washing, God forbid, an SUV. Well, that's wrong. That's, there's something called... Uh, confirmation bias, where you look at data and pick out the information that supports your concept. Our whole economy is based on confirmation bias right now. My generation thinks about this as the norm. Ozzy stayed home. I mean, Ozzy went to work. Harriet stayed home with David and Ricky. Uh, that is only 7.9% of all U.S. households. They live, that's Ozzy and Harriet's house now worth $5 million in Brentwood or someplace like that. 62% uh, of the dwellings in the U.S. are based on the Ozzy and Harriet model, these detached houses, housing, automobiles, and people, still designed for the traditional American family, who we really are. 21.8% are married couples with children. It used to be north of 50% when we were growing up, hence this embedded concept. When politicians stand up and say, the American family, they think about Ozzy and Harriet. Well, it ain't Ozzy and Harriet. 8.5% uh, female head of household and 2.8% male head of household, those poor kids. <laughs> this is a slide that Nathan uh, probably referring to. We've been showing since 2004, this convergence of the two largest generations in American history in a life stage where urbanism, where walkable neighborhoods, where community trumps the, the dwelling unit. The two big generations are the baby boomers. Now it's 75.4 million. We're starting to die off. Uh, born 60, 46 to 64. I was the first boomer. You've all heard that, I'm sure. Um, and the millennials. And this is, Andre's talked about the millennials, and I'm going to talk about millennials, because these 
are the folks who are going to be steering the boat for the rest of our lives, for the rest of the lives for everybody in this room. And they are incredibly important to understand. Lori and I made a career understanding boomers. It was depressing, <laughs> but we understood them very well. We are beginning to get an inkling of an idea of who the millennials are, but that will only be revealed over decades. But they are the most important people in this country right now and for the foreseeable future. These two big generations converging in favor of urbanism, mostly one and two person households, uh, just shy of 60% of American households have only one or two people in them. Uh, and nationally, two thirds of home buyers are singles and couples. And yet we have all these single family detached houses. I can't imagine how many empty bedrooms there are in America. If you counted those up, it would be astonishing. The Syrian refugee crisis, you can handle the Syrian refugees times a hundred. But of course, none of our governors want to help anybody. Um, eight to 12 percent of home purchases made by single men, check out the decor. Um, 16 to 24 percent made by single women, contrast the decor. Uh, no, I didn't include gay men in the first slide because their decor trumps the, <laughs> the uh, single female. Now, this, it, it, the important image on this slide is her not Chin's girl up there, because most of the, uh, of the single women are older. They are uh, widows, divorcees, uh, recently freed from uh, their ball and chain, uh, either by death or by uh, courts. 30 to 32% of home purchases made by couples, and look at the variety of, of couples here, same-sex couples, uh, interracial couples, um, and then 35 to 37, still the largest group is families with kids, but traditional and non-traditional families. You've got the, the gay couple with kids, you've got the single dad, you've got the older brother, younger brother, you've got the single mom, you've got the, uh, the family with the dog and the robot, uh, <laughs> which is, that's something else that Andres was talking about taking the, the long view. Uh, the, the long view looks at that picture and the, the most frightening image is the robot. Uh, because when artificial intelligence actually becomes self-aware, um, the Terminator movie will be a documentary. <laughs> and some people suggest that's within the next 50 years. Um, Nathan's housing stock, nation's housing stock designed for families, I've already mentioned this, in a market dominated by singles and couples. The rest of this talk is basically going to be about millennials and what it means for your city. The millennials are the green bars, and the last date here is 2045. You see the white, uh, white bars are the boomers, uh, colored after my hair, declining uh, with uh, death. The orange is the Gen X. This is a generation that really got screwed, the demographers disliked them so much that they only gave them like 11 years. Most generations are 20 years. Uh, <laughs> millennials are still mostly single. They are highly social both in person and more, actually more than in person in the digital world and social media. Ethnically and culturally diverse, I'll give you data on that in a moment. Still early in unsettled careers, even though the oldest one is now 39. Um, more likely to be renters, uh, even though the oldest one is now 39. Very mobile. This is the first generation where a significant group will move to a city before they get the job. They decide where they want to live before they get employed. And they are green. They are really green. They are genuinely green. They have BS detectors for greenwashing. You see this guy up here takes his own park with him wherever he goes. <laughs> this is a, a table that we do, there's a couple different tables that we do to try to wrap our minds around 
generation. So one that I'm not, I'm not showing here, but how old uh, you uh, different generations were at certain events, like uh, for the for our generation, it was Kennedy's assassination, the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan, Reagan's inauguration, the blow, the explosion of the Challenger was important for the for the Gen X. Uh, for the millennials, it might have been uh, the the discovery of Justin Bieber on uh, on uh, what was it uh, YouTube, I think, um, and uh, of course the crash. But this is another one where you look at the impact on age-related institutions. As the first baby boomer, and as a tall guy, and as a guy whose last name starts with Z, I, whether they line us up alphabetically or by height, I was always the last guy. And as the first uh, group of, uh, of boomers in kindergarten, uh, there was one. There wasn't. There weren't enough desks. There weren't enough uh, classrooms. There weren't enough spaces at uh, uh, at Oxford. Uh, it, you know, it, it just kept going on and on and on. And so here I am, doing this. Uh, <laughs> so you look at at the at the the impact on uh, economic uh, age related economic activities in all predecessor generations. You would have seen by now. Uh, a big apartment condo boom, which has occurred, but married with children and detached houses, which has not. And that has something to do with entering the job market and has a lot to do with their attitude. Now, when we talk about millennials, this is an image that comes to mind, a bearded hipster with his fixie and his handlebar, uh, uh, handlebar mustache, handlebar that matches his, uh, his beard. But, but I'm going to talk about millennials with a very broad brush, and this guy is really an outlier, as is this guy, the bow hunter with his, uh, I think that's an elk. Um, but the general tendencies of this group, if you look at, the, at the, the broad tendencies of this very large age cohort, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So, you know, we constantly get people saying, well, I have a millennial son, and and he uh, he uh, is uh, living on a on a farm, and 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 uh, he's a you know he goes on and on. Well, you know you can pick out anyone from any generation uh, as as outliers. Seventy percent of millennials are foreign born. Uh, this is very important uh, as if we have a serious debate nationally on immigration. 44% of millennials are minority race or ethnic groups. This is the first generation that grew up with multicultural as the multi uh, multicultural cohorts as the norm. This is extremely important because uh, you know, we talk to millennials all the time, and the the issue, of course, we're in urban places for the most part, so you have to you have to understand the context, but. but uh, the whole issue of race and ethnicity does not exist in these people's minds. Then there is the majority minority, which is a, an incredible economic powerhouse, millennial women. Now, when we do in, in urban areas and meet with, with stakeholders and meet with residents or would-be residents, it's striking how focused the women are and how unfocused the men are. I, and as a man, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Uh, anyway, they are now, I mean, talk about focus, 57% of bachelor degrees last year, women. 63% of master's degrees, women. 53% of doctorates, women. You know, it used to be, oh, the girls were so bright, and then like in seventh grade or something, the men start to start to pull ahead. Well, that, maybe not so much anymore. Then we have this. This is, a, this is one area where the millennials are following trends of previous generations. Delaying marriage, delaying childbirth. You look at 1960. Men 23, women 20 went at their first marriage. Uh, 
And the last year we have data for is uh, 19, uh, uh, sorry, two, 2014, men up to over 29 and women at 27. It's the big question when I talked about um, about confirmation bias of, uh, of survey data. You read surveys or reports on surveys and publications all the time about millennials uh, suddenly adopting the uh, the economic uh, tendencies of the pro of previous generations. So the big question facing housing in particular is will millennials embrace the ownership society? Uh, so far, that hasn't happened. Uh, first time buyers are typically a 40% share of sales in housing. Uh, in 2015, it was only 32%, the lowest it's been since it's been recorded. Now, if you think about the housing industry, if you don't have first time buyers, the units that are owned by the people who were first time buyers and want to move up or move laterally or move someplace else, they have a, a, a smaller pool of potential buyers. At the end of that chain are the baby boomers who uh, are potentially within 20 years are going to be sitting on a ton of single family houses that they no longer want, need, or can even manage to live in. And if that whole chain is, uh, is disrupted, there's going to be this uh, this huge problem. Chris Nelson has talked about the big senior sell-off, uh, the notion that there that we already have in the United States all the single-family detached houses we need. They're already here for the foreseeable future. For the I think he has a 30-year projection. We don't have a problem. They might not be in the right place, but we've got. Them. This looks at uh, millennial home ownership where it is. Uh, now this, again, confirmation bias, you have to understand that the framework here is from the bottom line is 13%, the top line is 174 which tends to exaggerate uh, the change, but the, the, starting in 1994 at 15%, we bumped up to uh, just before the crash when, you know, you could have liar's loans and, and anybody could qualify for one or two or three houses, however many you wanted. Then the crash happened, and it just, for the 18 to 34-year-olds, it continues to go way below historic norms. One of the problems is millennials are loaded with student debt. It's, uh, this, might be, this number might be a little bit old now, uh, but it's over a trillion dollars, and uh, almost 12% of it is delinquent or in default. Uh, there are a number of other issues that maybe if we have time for Q&A, we can, we can chat about. Uh, as to why millennials haven't bought. How millennials get around. Now, when I turned 17, I was there on my birthday to get my learner's permit. Um, in 1983, licensed drivers were still, uh, folks age 24, 20 to 24, were still 91%. The most recent year for which we have data, 2014, 77%. I mean, they're not buying cars. They're not even getting their driver's licenses because they've got this. They've got Zipcar if they need to do some serious hauling. And they've got the bike if this woman hauls her ball and chain around. <laughs> this, is a, this is an image for the future. Okay? If, you, if there's one image to take away from this presentation, this is it. She's in charge. He's even carrying her bag for her. <laughs> yeah, oh, she's wearing heels, of course, and no helmet. I will confess, this is in Amsterdam. And then there's the, the as Anders described, the, the, the greatest luxury of all is not even having to worry about the bike. Shoes, your feet. We just pulled together some data for a, a, a new book. Uh, that Doug Farr is doing is up, updating his sustainable urbanism book. Uh, and we looked at studies that we've done post crash because it's a new world. Younger singles, we, and we divide American households into 64 different groups that have very discrete characteristics, but we lump them together in three big groups so it's easy to talk about. 
young folks, old folks, and families. Younger singles and couples, market for downtown, a range of 56 to 86 percent. Empty nesters and retirees, a range of 9 percent to 34 percent. And traditional and non-traditional families, 3 percent to 16 percent. Now, let's compare it to our, we also, yes, question. Do you, do you elaborate on, on the range? What are the implications of that range? Why, why? Because every place is different. Um, and in some instances, we're looking at a core downtown in larger cities, uh, here, for example, uh, or in Baton Rouge. Um, whereas in, in much smaller towns, we're looking at the adjacent in-town neighborhoods that are still walkable by the classic definition of a, of a quarter mile to the main street. But because it's such a small city, it could have townhouses, it could even have detached houses. So uh, there's where the, where the range, the physical conditions are different. Um, if we compare a downtown, yeah, go ahead. No, this is, we don't call it market demand, we call it market potential. And I can get, if you want to talk to me later, I can explain in detail what the difference is. But demand, demand gives you the notion that, um, well, demand for housing works on the national level, on the, on the United States. Because you know you've got X number of dwelling units, and there's the potential for loss or fire demolition or whatever. And then you've got an increase in households. So the demand is the difference between the number of units and the increase in households. But when you get down to the local level, you can't have an increase in housing units on, in that alley space in there because there's no, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no potential for housing. So if you take a vacant lot, you can induce demand by, by putting housing there. So that arrow of causation, you need an increase in, in households to have housing units, but in a specific location, you need an increase in housing units to have an increase in households. And what we've done, as Nathan uh, described, is over the past quarter of a century, we've thrown out that old demand model and said, if you put the right thing in a place that people actually want, you can change settlement patterns. And we've done it all across the country. Because the old model says, yeah, what are you building now? Let's, let's do the same thing, only a little bit cheaper, or the same thing at the same, uh, at, at, uh, uh, same price, but a little bit better. So we're talking about market potential. These data, the traditional, non-traditional families for downtown, 3 to 16%, is the market potential, the range, for I think it was 35 different downtown studies that we've done since the, since the crash. If you compare the market, again, by big, uh, big life stage groups, the downtown to the, the work that we did at the same time for new traditional neighborhoods, you'll see a significant difference. The younger singles and households, 71% for downtown, only 31% for a traditional neighborhood and the plurality in the traditional neighborhood, which it really has uh, a majority of single family detached houses, um, is uh, the families, which is not surprising. Now I started this presentation with a TV ad. Here's a uh, uh, clip, for, uh, not a clip, but a screenshot from a television show called Orphan Black. Anybody here watch that? It's a comedy about clones. Um, and uh, this, uh, it's a Canadian comedy about clones. So, uh, the, but if you can't read it, it says this, uh, the clone has taken her stepbrother out to, uh, to Markham, actually, outside of uh, Toronto. Uh, oh my God, Ugg, I know you uh, had never gotten in if you said you were, we were going to suburbia. You know my skin just breaks out every time I leave downtown. That is an attitude that is obviously exaggerated for comic effect in this television show, but is actually exists among the 
uh, millennials. So what does the market want in downtown? So in those studies that I described, uh, you look at, those, at the, the market and you look at what their housing propensities are. Their, their, their tenure propensities, rental versus ownership, and their housing types. Now, in, in none of these did we include single family detached. Uh, and in many of these, the attached uh, single family was relegated to a small geographic area because of the, the physical characteristics. So the range here is probably more descriptive but less easy to wrap your head around than the average. Um, so I would encourage all of you not to pay attention to these numbers other than the general trends because everything in real estate is local. But again, rental apartments, the one, the one thing you can take away from this is that rental apartments range from plurality to a clear majority. And they are hard lofts, they are soft lofts, they are mini lofts, they are micro lofts. This is one in, in New York, 60,000 people um, are signed up to spend, I think it's 2,700 a month for a 350 square foot unit. Uh, this is Manhattan, which is a, 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 a different world. Um, so you see the millennials embracing these small units, and as a, as a geezer, I say, well, what about my stuff? You know, my TV used to look like this. Now, it, it, you, you, you scotch tape it to the wall. <laughs> this, this makes a huge difference in the size of how small a unit can be. Then you've got my library, my uh, DVD collection, uh, my, uh, my CD collection, my photographs. That's a lot of storage. Uh, it all fits on that. <laughs> you know, there was a famous, uh, Zipcar does, a, does a, uh, a survey every year. Again, confirmation bias to, to, to support their position of why do you need a car? You just, you know, you need to haul some stuff. Just get a zip car for the day. Uh, they asked uh, different generations uh, about the importance of four different devices. Their car, their television, their computer, and their smartphone. And uh, the millennials uh, really had no interest. Nobody had any interest in television anymore, surprisingly. That was, uh, for every generation, that was number four on the list. Uh, the car was number one for everybody but the millennials, and the, and the smartphone was definitely uh, the, the one uh, that, the, that the millennials, you'd have to, to quote Charles and Heston, you would have to pry it out of their cold, dead hand. <laughs> Uh, but what about my stuff? I mean, this is a uh, classic where you just, the steps to the loft are drawers. Um, so, you know, I was thinking the other day, 70% of the nation's GDP is consumer spending. You know, in reality, you hear that all the time. Reality is more like 50% because 20% of that is government spending on behalf of consumers, like health care, reimbursables, and so on. Uh, but still, that it is the big driver of the U.S. economy. So millennials really can't afford stuff. Boomers are trying to get rid of stuff. Millennials don't even want stuff. That, that, you know, that there's uh, years ago, Jim Kunstler, uh, fantastic uh, author and uh, cranky public intellectual, said, in in uh, before the midpoint of the century, we're gonna see the greatest potlatch on the history of the planet. The potlatch being the, the giveaway that was the tribal custom in the, the Pacific Northwest Native Americans. Because the boomers have got all this stuff and nobody wants it. You read articles about this, this surfeit of dining room furniture of China. You want, if you want bone china, man, this is a great time to buy bone china. Sterling silver, Piece of cake. As long as you go to the used places, you go to the regular guys, and they'll still sell it for you arm and leg. But I wonder if this this don't want the stuff, trying to give away the stuff, uh, the the uh, goodwill won't even take the stuff. If that means that, that this long-term slow economy that we've been in since the recession 
is really, that's the new normal. Because consumers are just not spending on, on things. So who will develop downtowns? You've got, and this is, you know, I, I apologize for actually blasting through information that should, should be a day's worth of, of discussion. The big developers think in chunks of 250 units. Um, uh, John Anderson, uh, who is a longtime CNU member, has started uh, a group that's exploring this, the small developers and actually has created models that are finance, FHA financeable of small mixed-use buildings. And this is the, the increment. So you walk around New Orleans, you know, the, the worst places in New Orleans are the places that were built by the big guys. They're the super blocks. The best places are those wonderful neighborhoods with that fine grain mix where there's a, something changes every 20 feet as you walk along. Well, you can do that again. It's devilishly difficult, but Anderson and the people that he's working with are beginning to assemble tools for small developers to do the kind of incremental organic development that made our great places here and actually around the world. Uh, filling the gap, for you folks in, uh, in the public sector, when we do downtown studies, almost always we, find, we establish a market position and the cost side and the revenue side don't match. There's a gap. And you've got to figure out a way to fill that gap. In New York City, this building has just sold a penthouse for $100 million. And that penthouse owner is getting tax abatement. Because, you, because in New York City, until that law was, was just allowed to lapse last month, all of the development that you saw in New York City for time immemorial was tax abated. And this is the place where those 350 square foot uh, rentals for $2,700 a month, you've got 60,000 people on the waiting list for them. So if New York, until two months ago, gave tax abatements on a penthouse that cost $100 million, Actually, in the news today, Donald Trump was getting tax abatement for uh, geared to middle income uh, New Yorkers. This, the, now the city, uh, the city said it was a mistake, it was a clerical error, but the tax break was for, is for households that earn under a half a million dollars a year. Uh, they were the middle, middle income in, in Manhattan. Public-private partnerships, this is the topic for a whole seminar. I'll just throw it out there. This is really uh, how uh, development has occurred in the cities where we've worked. Uh, the, the pioneer work that was done in Detroit eons ago uh, when Lori and the then downtown development director, Kate Beebe, determined to turn around the downtown. And now, of course, downtown New Center, it's, a, it's an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary recovery. But the, but the main thing was Kate putting together a gap finance fund, a $20 million revolving fund to fill the gap uh, to get these things going. Um, I can't not quote Holly White because this is still the magic ingredients of urbanism. People are attracted by other people. And you don't get that in the suburbs. The third place, Railenberg's great concept. For the millennials, it's to be alone together. How often have you seen this? And some of the boutique hotels are now putting together rooms with these big tables that have fabulous, super fast Wi-Fi and, and an espresso bar and, uh, and a whiskey bar. Uh, so that the millennials can be alone together. <laughs> now I'll close with something about the future. William Gibson 
So the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Now, well, I grew up, uh, this was the image of the future with the self-driving cars. They'd still have fins in the future, which was very cool, but you could play dominoes and not have to, uh, not have to steer. Well, that future is coming and much faster than we think it will be. This is one of the two great disruptors that we're going to see in, in the future. The self-driving vehicle revolution. This is a chart that was put together by McKinsey, the, uh, the research firm that did, uh, did a massive study last year. Uh, the parking space is reduced by billions of square meters. This was a global study, so they said square meters, but it's about six, in the US, by 2040, about 61 billion square feet of parking space, according to this analysis, will no longer be needed. And if you, if you use the standard mall thing of 30, 300 square feet per car, that's about a little over 200 million parking spaces that we won't need. Now, how many of those are going to be in town? The, the whole issue of what the self-driving car means for urbanism could go either way. It'll probably go both ways. One, the, 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 the great thing is that we won't need parking downtown. There'll be parking garages on the outskirts and you come home from work or come home from the bar because you're not driving, you can be stinking drunk and you stagger out of the car to your apartment building and tell the car to go find a parking place. And the, the, and the car goes off to the outskirts and plugs into the wall. This is, so all of the parking, the surface parking that litters our great cities. Our greatest cities still have way too much surface parking. Uh, we could talk about Georgia's taxation, but that's for another, another day. Um, all that's infill opportunity that's going to happen over the next three decades. How, what disruption is that going to be to the value of urban land? Does it go up? Does it go sideways? I don't know. Okay, so the pessimist in me says that thing that happened that, that, be, that fueled the crash, that drive till you qualify where your mortgage broker said you're only, you can only afford this much house and the home builder says, hey, out here, over here, I've got a house for you, and you drive, and you drive, and you drive, and you drive, and you find this plastic house at the end of a cul-de-sac in the excerpts. And fuel prices rose, and they became less interesting, the generational shift, the shift toward urbanism. So those became, that, that was the beginning of the zombie subdivision uh, of, the, of the mid last decade. But those zombies, you know, may be coming back to life. Because if you drive to your qualify and you can sit in your car and play uh, dominoes or, you know, read the Wall Street Journal or watch porn or whatever, whatever your thing is, um, then maybe those things suddenly make sense again. Uh, so this is, the, this is one of the two big disruptors. The other one is this. It's all red. This thing is, is not even a decade old. And look what it's done. It's just beginning. Some wings? You want a bon me? You want some summer rules? You want some, some of those uh, lomos saltados? I mean, and you, you name it. If you want it, you can have it delivered to where you are simply by holding this device up, punching a few keys, and bingo. Um, there are even restaurants in San Francisco and New York that deliver that don't exist. They're not real restaurants. They just live to produce food for people who are holding a cell phone somewhere. This is going to change everything. It's already disrupted major industries, and it's just, believe me, it has just gotten started. So, Think about the self-driving car. Think about the disruption to bricks and mortar that this thing does. Uh, and think about the millennials. Fortunately, we have time for
time for questions, so uh, go ahead. Who's got a question? I was so thorough. <laughs> I left. Okay. All right, we got David. He's got more questions. Okay. So, so one of the um, one of the objections that I hear sometimes. So we, I, I come from a, a small mid-sized city. In where? Lafayette. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah we so know Lafayette. When, when uh, I pose this kind of uh, data to uh, some individuals from the community, uh, the, the objection that I sometimes hear is, well, uh, millennials are delaying uh, the same decisions that yeah, that's what I started out with, was that slide. Yeah, I'm never getting married. I'm never having kids. I'm never moving to the suburbs. And, and yet it always comes true. It ends up with the guy washing the, uh, yeah. They're going to have the kids at 40 instead of 25. Well, actually, millennials are beginning to have kids. And, and, and a, a significant percentage are having kids first, then getting married. Um, but. Remember, the millennials, uh, I, 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 at some point I showed you the picture of the hipster and the bow hunter. Yeah. You are going to find millennials who are going to be just like their parents were. They're going to follow that same course, just like that Allstate or whatever New York Life ad or whatever the heck it was. Um, what I'm talking about is the broad center. You saw the, the, those who, draw, who have driver's licenses. 91% in 83, age 20 to 24, 77% now. That's real. You know, so, all right, so maybe if we go 25 to 30, the numbers will be slightly different. People will break down and get driver's licenses. It's not going to catch up. And this is a huge generation. It's the, by far the biggest in American history. So, yeah, you're going to find people who are going to follow the old path. And you're going to find people who are going to be this really weird hipster. But the, I think that the broad middle is going to be more urban. They are going to have kids, because if they don't, it, you know, talk about a, a surplus of single family houses. We're really going to be in trouble. We won't have any households. So they've got to have kids. But the weather, the one thing that, that I cut out of this presentation was the question, will millennials stay in the city? What they need to stay in this city is good schools. There's a strong correlation between parental involvement and school performance. Believe me that the, if the millennials do want to stay in, in cities, they will take care of the schools. Um, the uh, safe and secure streets and the perception of safe and secure streets. So not only does it have to be safe and secure, it has to feel safe and secure. The second is actually harder to do, uh, particularly with television news. Uh, and the third thing is, is uh, access to green space. Lots of green space. Little green space, big green space. Um, with, I think with the exception of the perception of safety and security, all of that is within the control of the millennials themselves. We see there the leading um, urbanists from the uh, from the Generation X uh, staying in the city. I mean, you go to uh, to Manhattan or North Brooklyn. Uh, it's the the hipster stroller conflict is unbelievable. I mean. The, New York City is crawling with kids. They're all rich kids because their parents can afford to, to, to have a dwelling unit. In New York City, because, because the kids are so important, the price per square foot concept is completely inverted. Typically, when you build something, you're going to have the highest price per square foot for the smallest unit because you, the, the core is common to all of them, the HVAC, the kitchen, and so on. Increment, expensive increments are bathrooms. In New York City, the highest price per square foot is for the multiple bedroom units. So three bedrooms higher price per square foot than the twos, twos than the ones, ones than the than the uh, um, than the studios. It's extraordinary because of children. There are other big cities that are having the same situation where kids, where the the 
the cities are becoming child friendly. The parents are making the cities child friendly. Was that your full question, Jason? You think so? Okay, but the other thing to simply say is that you've got a disconnect between the percentages that is so great in most places that that's where the opportunity is because you've got a certain supply of housing of this type and, and a certain demand for it. And then over here, it's completely out of whack because of the, the, the graphs uh, that uh, t uh, Todd was showing earlier. Yeah, people are arguing in Lafayette for more, for a major increase in single family detached, particularly that which is auto oriented. I would say that's a loser. There was a question back here. The guy who has first, is first. Has his hand up first. Testing. Do you still have a question? Testing. Testing. Yes, sir. I was wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, more public uh, spaces that millennials are attracted to and that a lot of people associate with cool cities, um, whether they're private or public. Just okay, the question is the character of public spaces. Uh, it's, it, uh, I. Uh, again, you could do a whole seminar on this. The uh, uh, public spaces can range from the great Olmsted and Box parks uh, that are huge and can absorb uh, activities, uh, concerts and, and sports things and so on, and can be as small as a very cool alley between, uh, between two buildings that lead to a bar that's tucked in the back alley. And the only thing that attracts you is the noise of the clinking glasses, the ice in the glasses, and the laughter. Everything in between. I mean, there is the, the thing about make as much stuff accessible to the public as you possibly can. If you're, crea if you're, if you're trying to create a, a downtown, you know, there's a lot of talk about activating alleys and so on. That's great, but the streets come first. The streets absolutely come first. Then you can get into these little places. But uh, an, an urban place, again, as Andre said, the ability to walk uh, in a city like New Orleans and walk down streets that are filled with street life and, and filled with a, a variation of buildings every 20 or 30 feet uh, is a delight in itself. In the, in the big cities, yeah, you see the, the moms and regrettably the nannies, uh, taking the children to the parks, but the kids are in strollers all over the streets as well. Uh, and they might just be going from the apartment to the soda shop. Question um, again? I'm gonna hold the mic just a little bit. Uh, so I have two questions. One is, you talked about the public-private partnership, but you just hinted at it just briefly. Yeah. Um, I'd like to kind of get a little more detail if you can kind of expound on what does that look like, how does that work? Um, and the second question is, Lafayette is, is basically an asset-rich place. Uh, we have plenty of land, plenty of space. So how do you kind of create something that people want to live downtown? I know we have you know, mall on one side of town, we have great uh, suburban areas. However, there, there's so much room to be able to build everything in most of those places that you describe. Um, they're, they're very uh, dense and everybody's kind of together because there's, there's not enough space, but we don't necessarily have that problem. So how do you create something um, that can work in, in that unique space? And could you discuss how a public-private partnership uh, can work and kind of discuss maybe... Okay, I'll answer question. the second one okay. first. Uh, the, we did a, a couple studies for downtown Lafayette. Um, and the renters should be the first people you pay attention to. Because if, they're, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna launch a neighborhood, or if you're gonna launch a neighborhood revitalization, the risk associated with a 12-month lease versus a 30-year mortgage, there's no comparison. Uh, plus, the market is still mostly renters. And I have some doubt as to whether the millennials will ever embrace ownership in the way that predecessor generations did. We're also seeing a phenomenon across the country of empty nesters. This is in more uh, expensive areas where 
relatively affluent empty nesters are choosing to move out of their single family houses and not into a condo or a co-op, but a rental. Because they do the math, they see the rental they can get out of as quickly as possible, and, the, and their monthly carry is lower than the even just the, the taxes associated with it, assuming that they're buying free and clear. So start with rentals and concentrate on the public realm. You need to make a great public realm. This is a question you need to ask Bob Gibbs tomorrow morning because the, the retail and uh, the entertainment and the restaurants, um, the programming that, that occurs uh, is essential. You get you bring people to downtown for events like uh, the Zydeco guy who's coming in, when is it, tomorrow? Roddy Romero. Well, huh? Roddy Romero. Yeah, but when? Roddy Romero, tomorrow? Yes. Okay, well you're gonna miss it, because you're, be you're gonna be stuck in New Orleans. Uh, but it's Roddy, getting rained out. <laughs> okay, so it's gonna be rained out, but Roddy Romero and, and whatever else, the, the crawfish boil and all the things that bring people downtown, the more they get accustomed to coming downtown, the more eventually they say to each other, a higher percentage of them say to each other, yeah, you know, this is nice. And, and if we lived here, we wouldn't have to park the damn car. We could just walk here. Uh, Public-private partnerships is, uh, there have been four-day uh, seminars on it. The, the one that we are, other than the, the GAP Finance Fund that was pioneered in, um, in Detroit and used in many other cities. Uh, the other uh, tool that is uh, very strong and, I, and has been up until now, but I wonder how much legs it's going to have, is public sector doing the parking uh, and contributing that to so that the, the parking load is not on the developer. And these are for cities that have an off-street parking requirement for, for dwelling units or for uh, or for non-residential uses. But you could do, there's uh, public-private partnerships, there are tons of different models and they vary for obviously from state to state because enabling legislation is different. Um, you know, tax increment and finance is, is one of the kind of public-private uh, partnership with the tools that are available. We've got one final question here. Okay. We're gonna go to a break. All right. Hi, good, good morning. Um, I'm glad you brought up about the millennials in order to stay in the city need good schools. Um, I was at the conference last year and the, I think one of the last presentations talked about uh, a walkable community and that in order to do that it needs to center on community and the center of community is school. Um, at that time I also mentioned that you know, in New Orleans, we're moving away from a neighborhood school model. In fact, the last two neighborhood schools were just um, taken away uh, from having that option. And uh, so my question is, when you're considering, you know, land use conversations, housing policy, and things like that, how do you have data on um, what is the driving force for people purchasing and choosing where to live? Because I think when you're talking about millennials or you know anybody that's young and is having a family, you know anecdotally I could say that the the number one driver is is this going to be close to my school or is a, a good school nearby? So first, do you have the data on that? And second, you know how often are people in these fields really engaging in the education policy uh, questions because if you're trying to create a city you know that looks good and is laid out well then i think the center is really the school as that presentation made but that we're not really actually seeing the level of engagement by all of in that yeah, um, well, the school issue is a longer term one. But right now, when we're trying to revitalize downtown, school's not, is, is not an issue. That's a, that's a second stage developing, maturing neighborhood issue. If you remember the data for the market for downtown, family's very, very small. Uh, the in-town neighborhoods, those neighborhoods that have uh, higher density, but a mix of uh, small apartment buildings, attached single-family townhouses, and so on, and uh, and small lot singles. 
there's where the families typically congregate and there's where schools are important. As far as data on, uh, on what attracts different demographics to different locations, National Association, National Association of Realtors does a survey every year. Uh, they are pretty good and unbiased. National Association of Home Builders does a survey every year. They are the kings of confirmation bias. Uh, but if you need, this is, the, this is the beauty part of all these entities doing, doing these surveys. Very few of them are really any good. Uh, but if you need data to support a point, you can find it. <laughs> The, um, and, and I'd add also that the school issue is uh, particularly difficult because of the silos. Silos. The decision making for how you grow your city is a different and separate uh, authority than the de de decision makers for how we handle our schools, which historically have also been different from how we handle our transportation uh, funding, which creates these silos that make making great cities really, really difficult. But you hit a very important point. Well, we're working on a job in a, in a city, it's, I, I don't think I can be at liberty to say where it is, but it's in Louisiana, uh, and it's uh, a new neighborhood that is uh, sponsored by a medical facility. Uh, at the core of the new neighborhood will be a charter school. And the charter school is going to form the the base of the downtown, you can, uh, the, the, presumably all of the public, uh, the, the community spaces in the charter school will also be available to the community, it's kind of synergy. We did one eons ago in Florida where the center of the community was uh, the county health department, uh, a K to uh, five, K to six school, uh, a YMCA, uh, and the library, and it was on parkland, which was important in the state of Florida because in parkland you can't put up mobile classrooms, so they couldn't sully the uh, area. It's a hideous looking building, but the outcomes for the children have been extraordinary because the parent can be on the treadmill next to the teacher just as a matter of course. Um, so there's those, there are models out there, but again, they're outliers because as, as Nathan says, the, uh, uh, the school, uh, school boards in particular are as, uh, as much in a silo as you can possibly be. It's more like a bunker than a silo. <laughs> Thank you very much.